Hey everyone, I'm Scott Leadingham. Thank you for joining us here. And today we are joined by Anna King in the Tri-Cities, a regional correspondent for the Northwest News Network. Thank you for joining us today, Anna. Happy to be here. So we are gonna talk for the next few minutes about a lot of, or several different topics, but mostly on apple and cherry tariffs and how that's affecting Northwest farmers. Also some drought issues going on in Oregon that Anna has been covering. So if you have any of those questions about those topics or some of the others that Anna covers here in the Northwest, do ask those in the comments section. We'll try to get to those now or afterward uh, here on the live stream. So Anna, first up, so apples might be getting some tariffs slapped on them by some other countries because of all the things we've been hearing about in the news. Just briefly summarize what's going on with tariffs and apples. Yeah, so there are tariffs happening both in uh, Canada and Mexico on, on many products that the Northwest produces. Specifically, there's a 15 to 25% tariff that's going to hit apples, pork, potatoes, cheese, cranberries, even bourbon whiskey. Um, and that's all a direct response to what has uh, happened with uh, President Trump doing tariffs on aluminum and steel. And so um, what that means is that Mexico is like the largest apple export market for Washington state. And apples are a huge part of our economy here. And we ship more than $200 million worth of apples a year. And so farmers are pretty upset. Um, that means a lot more apples are going to be dumped on the domestic market or have to find other export markets in other countries to sell these apples to. The problem is, is that Mexico takes a lot of the smaller apples. They like a smaller apple down there for their lunches and, and to eat. And um, that's really kind of where the value is added a lot of times with apples. They sell a lot of different varieties of apples down there, but um, it's kind of a niche market for our growers to be able to ship to and kind of get the market clear up here in the domestically. So um, they're watching it. A lot of people are upset. They are going to have to renew these markets in other countries, but that all takes a while. It takes a while for the infrastructure to get salesmen or saleswomen to different areas to start that pipeline flowing. And sometimes that can't happen in just one year, like from now until September when they start shipping those apples. So we should recognize that this is, of course, kind of a very dynamic situation. Things are kind of changing day to day on the news front about all these tariffs. So it could change tomorrow. Who knows? But until that time, uh, we're curious. Someone asked uh, on Facebook, Jamie asked on Facebook about the, maybe orchardists who possibly supported uh, President Trump in the election and how they're responding to these possible tariffs and, and his uh, interactions there. So what have you heard from orchardists and farmers about these tariffs? Farmers are a very diverse group. And so firstly, I'd just like to say that there's not just like one block of people and they vote in very unique ways, just like all populations. And they have a myriad of different reasons. But I have talked to quite a few farmers who still um, are very supportive of President Trump despite these trade tariffs and things. And they're saying, look, uh, you know, the economy uh, for a long, long time, we had this deficit with other countries and we need to bring that back in line. Whether you believe that or not, that's what they're telling me. And they're very concerned that they want the country to go on the right path. And they're very supportive of President Trump uh, to do that, uh, even though it might personally hurt on their own operation, their own ranch, their own farm. Um, and several have told me, in fact, one beef rancher in Oregon, who uh, will be the subject of a story I do in a little bit, told me, you know, if I have to personally suffer so that our country can go in the right direction, that's what I'll have to do. Wow, that's that's a quite a striking quote right there. So. Um, can you talk a little bit about the economics of shipping apples, um, if, if you can, about how the, the seasonal uh, crop is taken in the fall and then stored for a long time and then finally shipped? Because I think a lot of people just think like, oh, we pick them and then they go to the market the next week or something. That's not necessarily the case. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, apples are just like an incredible fruit and it's incredibly complex how they come off the trees and then how they're managed. But basically what happens is they load these huge boxes out into the fields and they use forklifts and tractors to drag them around out there. And then they load them up with the apples and they just put all the apples in the same bin, right? But then they're brought to a packing warehouse where they can be stored and packed when they want to ship those particular apples. So they'll put those apples in kind of special cold rooms with special gases to kind of put the apples to sleep, to put them to bed for a while. And so those are the apples that will stay for a while. And then they'll take some of the apples that don't store as well um, and they'll put those right out on the market first. And so that's why you see certain varieties at certain times of the year because certain apples are a lot better at storing than other apples. And while they're sleeping, those apples are converting starch to sugar. And so they have people watching these apples and testing them in labs and making sure so that when they reach the perfect right percentage of sweetness to starch that they yank those apples out of those cold rooms and then they process them through these complex sorting machines that actually are like little um they have eyes and uh like mechanical eyes that can sort the color the grade the size um how much red versus green is on an apple let's say like a fuji um and then they can be all packed so that they're all uniform kind of as best as they can into boxes and then those boxes are shipped to the supermarkets and shipped abroad and um, then the stores have to manage that fruit and make sure that they get those apples on the shelf and out to customers before they go bad. And so it's a very complex system. And that's when I say it takes a while for a pipeline to kind of move. Um, when Mexico goes away, all those systems were in place to get all the apples exactly down to Mexico at their peak ripeness. Well, if they wanna send those apples, let's say to Thailand, those people aren't ready, you know, the pipeline, the infrastructure just isn't ready to accept those apples. And I'm just using Thailand as an example. Um, it's not a, a real situation, but I, I think that that kind of explains why it's so complex. Just when they come off the tree to the customer, there's a huge amount of process that happens in between. Okay. So uh, all this talk about apple varieties making me hungry for my favorite apple variety. <laughs> Gala, the good old fashioned, I think it's kind of a, the old standard uh, in the Northwest. Uh, not a red delicious though, of course, that's, maybe that's kind of the standard. But uh, my favorite apple variety, that or a Braeburn, I'm too cheap uh, to get uh, honey crisp, right? I'm curious, oh, Anna, I'm gonna eat it here. What is your favorite apple variety? Um, so <laughs> I'm really partial to the opal apple. Um, it's a kind of a yellow, skinned apple it's really crispy it's kind of got a little bit of a bite to it with also the sweetness um i really like that i am not as much a fan of the uh you know kind of the real real sweet like a really sweet honey crisp apple i like them but i'm kind of partial to the little bit of zing or, or tartness that you get with some of the other varieties and uh there's this kind of this cosmic crisp thing that's been going on, which I do not get. That's a whole other uh, segment we could talk about. But uh, quickly, what's cosmic crisp? Because a lot of people might not have heard of that. Cosmic crisp is like WSU's prime baby right now. Um, they are really proud of the development of this new apple variety that's proprietary uh, and, and or, or not proprietary. I'm sorry, but will be kind of available to farmers and and starting to see in supermarkets in the coming years. And it's really exciting. It doesn't brown as easily when you cut it. And it's supposed to be really crispy and juicy and sweet all in the same time and a little zingy. And I haven't tasted one yet. So if you have one, Scott, you share. I wish I did. It's like the magic gold or whatever. Okay, so anyone out there has their favorite apple variety, send us a picture of you eating that apple variety or just a picture of that apple. Put it on Facebook. We'd love to see it. All right, moving on. So uh, the farm bill and as it affects Northwest farmers, you had a story about that a little bit 
uh, a few weeks ago. I'm just curious, um, how does this massive farm bill, which we've probably heard about, but not a lot of people really know what's in it and how it really affects almost everyone, not just farmers, but how is it affecting Northwest farmers? So that woman on the screen right now, uh, I went out to her family's farm and, uh, and talked with her. And it's, it's just really fun to actually interact with farmers on the ground about where this policy from Washington, D.C. actually meets their land and, and their landscape and changes things on the ground. And so what she was showing me there is that, you know, without crop insurance, um, Nicole Berg and her family just couldn't function. They couldn't have a farm because crop raising wheat and raising grains is so, so risky that you could have one good year and like five bad years and you never know what order they're going to come in. And so they plan on their farm. They, she actually told me out of every 10 years, they plan for three to four money losing really bad years. And that's why they have to have crop insurance to make sure that they kind of mitigating the risk of that farming. And she also pointed out the CRP ground. Now, if you don't know what CRP means, that's Conservation Reserve Program. And that's a big program through the federal government that kind of puts wheat ground into uh, like natural grasses for wildlife and conservation of soils and conservation of water. And so she was showing me this ground and she said, if this farm bill doesn't pass, this whole program is just going to go away by September 30th. And that means that any contracts that are up for renewal won't be renewed. And some of this land will have to start being farmed again, or some of this land might just go fallow and nobody's taking care of it because there's no money. And even despite being in the CRP program, these farmers still have to pay taxes on the ground. They still have to manage the ground. And so that really puts that in jeopardy. In Pullman, where you uh, are, uh, Scott, there's a lot of this kind of ground around. And um, the, in Washington, there's a surprising amount of it. There's 200 million acres just in Washington and Oregon. Wow, that's that's a huge amount. I had no idea. So uh, speaking of good years and bad years, uh, that often we often talk about that not only in farming, but as it relates to drought. And uh, just real quickly, you've been uh, in Oregon for a little bit reporting uh, some forthcoming stories that are going to be really interesting about the Oregon drought situation upcoming. Tell us a little bit about what we might be uh, hearing from you uh, in the near term about what's going on in Oregon. Yeah, so I... Uh took a, a, a SUV kind of a pickup thing down to Oregon and stomped around some dirt roads with my boots on. It was uh, pretty epic. Uh, there was some roads that I wasn't sure I was going to get over, a lot of rutted roads and really rough stuff. And when I was down there, what I found is that all of these farmers are really having a tough, tough time with the drought. They had a light snowpack and then just very few spring rainstorms. And then they have these strings of early warm days, which we've seen as well up here. And all of that has, you know, kind of combined to make this really bad drought. And that's affecting the grass. It's making the grass a lot shorter. So when cattlemen try to put their cattle out onto the rangeland, there's just not as much to eat out there. They also are having to haul water into some of their uh, watering holes that should have ample water for the whole year. They're having to haul like 8,000 gallons at a time into these areas so that they can have enough water for their cattle to drink. And they're also having really big problems with their hay fields. Some of their wells are going dry or they're not able to pump out of their wells. And they're also not uh, flood irrigating like they usually do. And so one ranching family I talked with said out of uh, several hundred acres that they usually hay, they're only going to hay 38 acres this year. That's an incredible financial hit in many ways for ranchers because one, they can't cut hay for the winter and put that away and store it. Two, they usually are able to graze that ground on the second cut with their cattle and they won't be able to do that this year. And three, now they're gonna have to buy hay just to make up the difference. Wow, quite a complex story. And just to, just to clarify real quickly, not expecting as bad a year or uh, those issues in Washington, right? Because we're better off from the, the winter snowpack. 
We're a little better off, Scott, but in many of the range areas, they're seeing the same problems as in Oregon. This, this drought is stretching from Washington, you know, southeast Washington, down through Oregon, all the way through Canada, Nevada, Texas, uh, up into the Dakotas. This is a widespread drought. Life in the great American West. Well, Anna, thank you so much. When those stories do come out, you can listen for those at nwpv.org, where we will have lots of extensive web stories as well. You'll find all of that and more from Anna King at nwpv.org. Thank you so much for joining us today, Anna. Thanks for having me, Scott. It's a real pleasure. And thank you all for joining us here on Facebook. We do it every week, uh, every Friday, that is, at noon. Thank you for joining us here in the unique Northwest.